This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidui Yuat. It's Thursday, October 15th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future, as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on, and we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. A United Nations report due to be published this week details the strong financial position of the Somali militant group Al-Shabaab, including how it is moving millions of dollars through the formal banking system and investing in property and businesses. David Doyle has the details. Somali militant group Al-Shabaab is moving millions of dollars through the formal banking system and even appears to be investing in businesses and real estate. That's according to a UN report due to be published this week, which details the strong financial position of the Al-Qaeda-linked insurgents. Al-Shabaab has been battling Somalia's government for years, carrying out frequent bombings and attacks, and has also killed hundreds of civilians in Kenya and Uganda. In a rare glimpse into its finances, the report from the UN sanctions panel on Somalia says Al-Shabaab generates a significant budgetary surplus, some of which is invested in property and businesses in the capital Mogadishu. The report also gives details on two accounts held at Salam Somali Bank, which was founded in 2009 as a part of the Hormood group of companies. Nearly 1.7 million US dollars is said to have moved through one of the accounts during a 10-week period this year, while over four months, 1.1 million passed through the other, which appeared to handle fees levied on businessmen using Mogadishu port. Somalia's financial reporting centre said it was investigating. The bank did not respond to requests for comment. But those accounts raise questions about Somalia's capacity to enforce a 2016 law aimed at curbing terrorist financing. The UN report also details how the Islamist insurgents make millions from road checkpoints and through payments from fearful businesses. With around 5,000 fighters, Al-Shabaab controls towns and countryside in southern Somalia, but its spies and assassins operate nationwide. Its estimated expenditure last year was around $21 million, with about a quarter going to its Amniat intelligence arm. David Doyle of Reuters with that report. The South Sudanese government and rebels of the South Sudan Opposition Movement Alliance says this week have agreed in principle in Rome to cease hostilities. The group, which comprises National Salvation Front, has yet to sign the 2018 Revitalized Peace Agreement a spokesperson for the South Sudan Opposition Movements Alliance says the cease hostilities agreement will lead to negotiations that will eventually resort to a comprehensive peace agreement. The group came to the negotiating table not because it wants positions in the transitional government of national unity, but because it is more concerned about the suffering of the South Sudanese people, according to the spokesperson. The number of confirmed COVID-19 infections worldwide is accelerating with more than 38 million cases and a death toll exceeding 1 million as of Wednesday. The United States remains the worst hit country in the world, followed by India and Brazil. We get more from BOA's Maria Madiallo. The World Health Organization says many countries are reporting an increase in coronavirus hospitalizations. At the same time, the WHO says it's been an uneven pandemic because of how countries have responded and how they've been affected. Almost 70% of all cases reported globally last week were from 10 countries. And almost half of all cases were from just three countries. The WHO Director General also said while there has been some discussion about the concept of herd immunity by letting the virus spread, he is not in favor of it. Herd immunity is a concept used for vaccination in which a population can be protected from a certain virus if a threshold of vaccination is reached. For example, 
herd immunity against measles requires about 95% of a population to be vaccinated. For polio, the threshold is about 80%. In other words, herd immunity is achieved by protecting people from a virus, not by exposing them to it. Meanwhile, in the U.S., the country with the most coronavirus cases, election campaigning is in full swing weeks before the November 3rd contest. President Trump is back on the campaign trail after contracting the virus about two weeks ago. His Democratic challenger, Joe Biden, continues to criticize Trump's handling of the pandemic. Folks, Donald Trump's chaotic and divisive leadership has cost us far too much. 215,000 dead from COVID-19 and rising. Trump insists better days lie ahead. Right now I'm fighting to eradicate the virus, rebuild the economy and save our country from the radical left. This week, Johnson & Johnson said it was pausing clinical trials of a COVID-19 vaccine due to an unexplained illness in a study participant. Drug maker Eli Lilly said it was also halting its coronavirus antibody trial because of safety concerns. Meanwhile, hopes for passing a new coronavirus relief package faded as U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi rejected the White House's $1.8 trillion proposal. Delays are prompting anxiety in financial markets, according to analysts. I think investors are frustrated that Washington can't seem to get its act together to give a package to the country, which is sorely needed, especially for small business, before the election. In Europe, France has recently seen record numbers of confirmed COVID-19 cases, prompting President Emmanuel Macron to impose a nighttime curfew for Paris and several other cities. In Spain, where the number of cases is higher than anywhere else in Western Europe, emotional fatigue has set in among some of the intensive care staff. In Britain, London's mayor warns of tougher coronavirus restrictions as cases rise. I'm afraid the bad news is that all the indicators we have, the number of new cases, uh, the positivity rate, admissions to hospitals, uh, admissions in ICUs, uh, cases of older people, uh, all the indicators we have are that things are going in the wrong direction. Restrictions include a six-person limit on social gatherings and a 10 p.m. curfew in pubs, clubs and restaurants. Maria Magalo, VOA News. Saeed Mohammed fled civil war in Somalia as a teenager to South Africa 30 years later after building a successful career. The COVID-19 pandemic is providing an opportunity for him to give back. Sisipo Sikweya explains. At 17 years old, Saeed Mohammed fled civil war in Somalia. That was 30 years ago but he still remembers the kindness he and his family received when they arrived in South Africa. In the years since, he's built a successful career as a banker, and now a world of restrictions and lockdowns has presented a chance to give back. You know what? Here are people who welcome us in their country uh, and who host us in their country, and there must be a way that we need to contribute back. He's part of a Somali business community that launched a campaign to help people like South African beneficiary Regina, who were also likely to struggle under strict stay-at-home conditions. We are struggling to buy food, and mostly the money that we get is not enough to cover all the expenses that we have in the house. They started by distributing hand sanitizers and food parcels in informal settlements in Pretoria and Johannesburg, according to the UN Refugee Agency. Hussein Muhammad has helped 600 families during lockdown. Amin Shaikh is another Somali refugee businessman. A lot of people lost their jobs, which means if they cannot feed their family, then that is you know, a moment that you have to get up and give back to the community. UNHCR says South Africa is host to nearly 267,000 refugees and asylum seekers. 30% coming from Somalia. Sisi Posikoya of Reuters with that report. Firefighters are on their fifth day Thursday of trying to contain a forest fire in a conservation area on Mount Kilimanjaro, Africa's tallest peak. Tanzania's Minister of Natural Resources and Tourism, Hamisi Kiwagala, says the fire is threatening the Alpine Ecological Zone, 
which is inhabited by various wildlife, including birds, snakes, and lizards. Kigwangala also says dry conditions, strong weeds, and the location of the fire are hampering efforts to bring it under control. The Citizen newspaper is reporting that Tanzania's government will buy helicopters to bolster efforts to fight wildfires. Initial reports indicate that the fire was caused by porters eating food for climbers on Sunday, but the probe into the blaze continues. There have been no reports of human casualties. Vulture numbers are dwindling in Kenya, partly due to poisoning with the scavengers ending up as collateral damage in a battle between farmers and other predators. Julian Satterthwaite reports. In Kenya's Orpage to Conservancy, a group of vultures is enjoying a feast. But scenes like this are getting scarcer, and the danger to these scavengers is often lying in their food. Dr. Darcy Ogada is Assistant Director of Programs at conservation group The Peregrine Fund. Well, the biggest threat to vultures is poisoning, and that is generally not targeted at the vultures. It's actually targeted at carnivores, mostly lions, hyenas, uh, leopards as well, because the carnivores are actually occasionally killing livestock. When farmers lace carcasses with pesticides, it's often vultures and other birds of prey that are first at the scene. Several dozen birds can die in a single poisoning, and it takes decades for the population to recover due to their long lives and slow breeding patterns. You're talking many um, generations, many years before you're going to get those birds back. Four of the eight vulture species in Kenya are critically endangered. Dr. Ogada says the population of one of those species, the hooded vulture, has plunged by nearly 90% in Kenya over the past 45 years. In response, Peregrine Fund offers training in pastoral communities. But program manager Martin Adino says it's not just a case of telling farmers to stop poisoning. Uh, we offer a kind of uh, simple solution to this whereby very cheaply we also train communities to, to build predator-proof shelters for their livestock. The project is focused on conservancies in Kenya's Laikipia and Samburu regions, home to globally significant populations of lion, black rhino, elephant and gravy zebra. The Idaho-based charity says those species are also put at risk if the numbers of one of Africa's top scavengers dwindle due to the knock-on impact that has on the wider ecosystem. Julian Satterthwait of Reuters with that report. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up, in the countdown to the U.S. election, both President Donald Trump and his rival former Vice President Joe Biden are ramping up their campaigns to win the hearts and minds of voters. Stay with us. medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. 
Times change for political parties and the people who support them. Abraham Lincoln was the first U.S. president from the Republican Party. He led the country through the Civil War that preserved the Union and ended slavery. After the war, newly enfranchised African-American male voters supported the Republican Party, which was committed to civil rights for the recently emancipated. At the same time, the Democratic Party included white supremacists who opposed civil rights for black citizens. But during the 20th century, things began to change. Democrat Franklin D. Roosevelt, first elected in 1932, made his party more appealing to African Americans. FDR took measures to lead the country out of an economic depression, and while that was happening, civil rights became less important to many Republicans. African American support for FDR spiked in 1936, and support for Democratic presidential candidates has remained strong ever since. Another shift happened in the 1960s. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 passed with support from both parties at the urging of Democratic President Lyndon B. Johnson. After those votes, white segregationist Democrats fled the party in large numbers, creating Republican majorities across the South. The modern political landscape is now almost a reverse image of the one that existed more than a century ago, with African Americans overwhelmingly supporting the Democrats and Republicans backed predominantly by whites. Welcome back to Africa 54. New York City is seeing a rise in COVID-19 cases as the number of deaths in the city nears 24,000. City leaders are shutting down some parts of New York to contain the virus while businesses continue to struggle to stay afloat. Meanwhile, one group is helping recent U.S. immigrants as they adapt to a new country and deal with the pandemic. Keith Kosinski has more. 32-year-old Ali Alberkawi is living in the Queensboro of New York City, a world away from his native Morocco. He moved here in 2018 to be with his American wife. Now he's adjusting to a new world without his family and friends back home. It was really hard at first. Try to apply for different jobs, like anything like you know, uh, Starbucks, McDonald's, anything that can start with, you know. Um, but no one gave back to me. After being unemployed for months, Ali says he started to lose faith. But that changed after he received help from Common Point Queens, a nonprofit organization that provides job support. The group helped Ali develop a resume, prepare for an interview, and even hired him for various jobs. Then in March, the coronavirus pandemic hit. So the pandemic kind of got it worse a little bit. Before, I had all these different jobs, like working in all these departments uh, with Common Point Queen. But after the pandemic, like everything shuts down. It really affected me like financially. But soon after, Common Point hired him to work at a daycare for the children of frontline workers fighting the pandemic. However, with the unemployment rate in New York soaring over 20% during the worst of the pandemic, many others weren't as lucky. Officials say immigrants are being especially hit hard, particularly in Queens, which has one of the highest rates of undocumented residents in the nation. Many are paid in cash and receive no unemployment benefits. The phone does not stop ringing. Unfortunately, the demand for food is increasing. CEO Danielle Elman says the nonprofit provided food to nearly 9,000 people by August. That's about 8,000 more than expected. That tells you what is going on in the borough of Queens right now and the, and the ways and the resources that we need to provide people immediately while we work on these long-term solutions because we have to believe that New York is going to get back on its feet. Earlier this month, Common Point Queens combined with the United Jewish Appeal Federation of New York to open the hub. The nearly 10,000 square foot facility provides food, job placement assistance, and vocational training. We're trying not to give a client just a job. We're trying to help them literally start a pathway towards success. The hub is expected to serve 6,000 clients in the first year and open six other locations to help those like Ali build a more stable future. I need to make a plan. I need to make something that's permanent, that's not like just temporary, you know, like something that's going to be better for me and also I will not be affected when something like this pandemic happens in the future. Ali is to begin studying computer information systems in the near future. Keith Kosinski for VOA News, 
Queens, New York. This week, the U.S. Senate is holding confirmation hearings for Judge Amy Connie Barrett to fill the Supreme Court seat left empty by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who died last month. Supreme Court justices receive lifetime positions that hold great power, and the battle to fill the seat has become a focus of the contest between President Donald Trump and his challenger, Joe Biden. VOA's Patsy Widakuswara reports. Protesters and supporters of Amy Coney Barrett square off outside of the Supreme Court as the conservative judge faces tough questions from Senate Democrats, including whether she will recuse herself from cases that could impact the outcome of the November election. I will apply the factors that other justices have before me in determining whether the circumstances require my recusal or not. But I can't offer a legal conclusion right now about the outcome of the decision I would reach. Appointment of conservative judges is a key campaign promise for President Donald Trump, who often frames it in ideological terms. If Joe Biden and the Democrats take power, they will pack the Supreme Court with far-left radical who will unilaterally transform American society far beyond recognition. Currently behind in opinion polls, Trump frequently claims the only way he will lose against Democratic nominee Joe Biden is if the election is rigged. With dozens of election-related lawsuits already filed, close results in swing states could mean a scenario like the 2000 race between George W. Bush and Al Gore, where the result was decided by a Supreme Court vote. Statements by Trump and some Republicans suggesting that Barrett must be confirmed to ensure the court rules in their favor in post-election litigation creates the appearance of impropriety, said constitutional expert Adam White. They have really created a cloud that I think she is going to have to dispel uh, through her own work on the court to make very clear that when she's appointed to the court that she doesn't answer to President Trump, she doesn't answer to anybody but the law. If Barrett is confirmed, there will be six justices appointed by Republican presidents and three appointed by Democrats. If Biden wins, some Democrats want him to appoint more Supreme Court justices, arguing that it would help ideologically balance the court. Republicans strongly oppose that. The number of justices is not set in the Constitution, but there have been nine since 1869. If you add more and more seats, you're going to have small coalitions that have to engage in sort of compromise and, and, and I won't say bartering, but it'll look less and less like a principled body of decisions and more and more like a set of legislative compromises. Biden says he's not a fan of court packing, but has largely avoided the issue, focusing instead on Democrats' concern that the court could overturn a signature Obama-era legislation that expands Americans' access to health care. This nominee said she wants to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. The president wants to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. Barrett insisted that if confirmed, she has no agenda on Obamacare or other politically divisive issues, including abortion rights and same-sex marriage. Patsy Wida Kuswara, VOA News. Both Trump and Biden are campaigning hard in the southeastern state of Florida, which has 29 of the 270 electoral votes either candidate would need to win the election. America's biggest swing state and a haven for retirees, Florida has chosen the winner of the last six presidential contests. VOA's Caroline Prasuti reports from Miami on what it will take to carry the state. Joni Stein's neighbor Ricky made her another Joe Biden campaign sign when hers was stolen from her yard. Get off my lawn. We're not voting for that man. Either. Stein can't even bring herself to say Donald Trump's name. I have the same values as Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. I, um, opposite, opposite values of the other uh, person who's running again. At age 71, Stein is among Florida's 4 million senior citizens who have a big say in how the state votes. So is Graciela Law, an Argentinian immigrant who just cast her early ballot for President Trump. We need someone that is not only concerned about every American citizen. We need someone that knows how to be a president, that knows how to be a leader, 
you cannot protect the inside of your house if you have your door open and anybody can walk in. Law was referring to Trump's tough immigration policies that are popular with his base. Florida voters are key to presidential elections. Not since Bill Clinton in 1992 has a presidential contender won the White House without winning Florida. Thank you. In fact, in the last five presidential elections, just a few percentage points separated the top two candidates. And in each election, the winner of Florida went on to become president. El agua, la luz. Political ads in English and Spanish flood the airwaves in Florida, where one in four people is of Hispanic descent. I'm going to be good to go down. As almost Trump has repeatedly accused Biden of harboring a socialist agenda for America, a charge rejected by Alberto Sanchez, who is originally from Puerto Rico. It's ironic that the local propaganda that they're doing is to make it to try to get the Venezuelan Cuban vote is to make Biden seem like he would be a socialist that would drive you to communists as these leaders when it's totally the opposite. Uh, there couldn't be a more centrist candidate. But questions about socialist leanings resonate loudly in Florida, according to Javier Pollitt of the Hispanic Advisory Council. He's all in for Trump. The Hispanics, a, a capitalistic system is very, very important. We immigrated here, many of us, and we've worked hard in the, on our forefathers before us with our parents worked very, very hard to give us the things that we all have had, had today and the liberties that we have today in Florida. Arthur Simon is a political science professor at the University of Miami who served six terms in the House of Representatives. The Puerto Rican vote tends to tilt towards the Democrats whereas the Cuban-American vote in Florida tended to tilt towards Republicans. So. Uh, and it could balance, they, these two groups could balance themselves out. Professor Simon says voter turnout will likely decide the contest. More than a million Floridians have already cast an early ballot. Carolyn Prasuti, VOA News, Miami, Florida. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com from all of us here in Washington. Thank you for watching. more than just sitting here and talking about women's issues it's about listening to them and bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard because our lived experiences our stories and our voices will help shape the next generation 